An exuberant greetings to everyone from different parts of the globe. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you at MICA for the book launch of Artificial Intelligence and Customer Service, the next frontier for personalized engagement. With that note, we all know that artificial intelligence in service is definitely one of the key themes of the present times. After traversing a long journey, officially from Dermouth Conference in 1950s to engaging in world with the brands to chat GPTs, according to the leading analyst, 95% of customer interactions are expected to be AI enabled in next couple of years. AI can help business stay competitive and meet customer expectations in an increasingly digital and data-driven world. But as organizations try to implement AI across channels, they will definitely need to reimagine the role that service and the role of AI in the larger canvas of engaging the customers. And this is where the book comes handy. So we are glad to see this book particularly in the service industry and quite ex excited to read the contributions from various authors. Before we begin, I request Professor Varsha Jain, the editor of this book, to please give away her opening remarks. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us. I know it's uh, very, uh, you know, challenging to make the time out for an event. So we are extremely grateful for all of you for your time and efforts for being with us. AI is a constant journey, as we all know, and there's always a moment to learn from each other and co-create knowledge. And uh, with that note, I would like to welcome our keynote speakers, Professor Meng and Professor Berry for being with us. Thank you so much. We are humbled and honored to have you as the distinguished speakers for today because uh, you've been working into the space since a long time and we really want to learn from your insights and your ongoing journey with AI and customer services. Thank you so much for being with us. I would also like to welcome our Dean, Micah, uh, Dr. Hegre, and uh, I would also like to mention that our president, Dr. Mehta, has uh, shared his uh, best wishes while he's traveling to the US. He could not be there, so but he has sent his wishes to us. So thank you so much to our president. I would also like to welcome all our colleagues, researchers, scholars all over the world. Thank you so much. You all have been joining from different parts of the world. I could see your contributors as well. Thank you so much for being with us and making this journey so wonderful. And I was discussing this about the book that this uh, AI driven world is actually being co-created from different parts of the world and the contributors that we have from uh, you know various continents and uh, they have actually given their ongoing journey experiences and insights in the book. So we are extremely grateful to them. And I could see my co-editors also here. So thank you so much for being with us and making this journey so exciting. And uh, somewhere uh, while we were doing this journey, I read this note that AI can actually get to the root cause and the biases also can be seen while the value exchanges and co-creations are being created. And with that, I think uh, it has a dual sort, which is uh, positive as well as negative. We have to be very careful while using the technology as we evolve through internet and then digital and social media. Now we are in AR driven world. So I think we have to be very careful while using it. But yes, it's a very uh, handy, enabled tool which can be used in the businesses at various uh, levels. Uh, from the strategy to operations as well as in the front line. So we are extremely uh, delighted to create this knowledge with you all. And uh, this book heavily relies on the ongoing process and cutting edge research with all the contributors have been doing. So we are extremely grateful for that. With that note, I would like to invite our Dean, Micah, Professor Hegre to share her opening remark and welcome all our guests and to say a few words about the book. Professor Hegre. 
Uh, okay, hi. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Professor Varsha. And uh, thank you everybody for joining in. Um, I, I think this is a very, very relevant topic and that MICA especially, uh, we are always ahead of uh, understanding cons consumers and customer insights. Um, congratulations and also to the uh, contributors uh, who have uh, you know contributed to the uh, to these to this wonderful uh, book on artificial intelligence in customer service uh, we all know that uh, ai has already taken over our lives especially you know multiple examples for example you know for example uh, if you are traveling anywhere nobody uh, would travel without uh, google map and uh, so there is uh, there is such uh, examples where all of us are uh, being uh, supported by AI in our daily lives. But I think uh, where uh, there is going to be a huge impact is especially on uh, customer service, especially when uh, we have this hyper-personalization uh, happening in, in the customer service area. Uh, so uh, with that, I would say a great book. And uh, I think differentiation of uh, how AI uh, will help in customer service is something that uh, we need to look at. And especially for academicians, I feel uh, what is needed is uh, to understand and to also disseminate to our students, uh, is, uh, more importantly, uh, what would be the consequence of such uh, interventions or such fast paced uh, disruption. And as I told you, some of the disruptions in which we don't even feel disrupted because uh, it has become a new normal. So with that, um, congratulations once again uh, to all the authors and the editors. And I'm eagerly waiting to hear from the uh, keynote speaker as well. Uh, congratulations all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hegre, for your warm welcome and sharing your valuable insights. And I would request now to please switch on your cameras as we go away uh, with the unraveling of the book. It's a valuable moment for the editors and the contributing authors and across the globe. It is my absolute pleasure to request our distinguished speakers, Professor Berry, Professor Ming, our Dean Maika, co-editors of the book, Dr. Varsha Jain, Dr. Anupam Ambika, and we have Dr. Emmanuel to please join us in officially launching this incredible book on AI. We wholeheartedly congratulate the co-authors for this wonderful book once again. Can I request to hoist the copies if you have? It would be great. Thank you so much. It is such a wonderful delight to see Artificial Intelligence book. And we also once again congratulate the book editors for the and lot of contributing authors for the valuable contribution in the ever-growing landscape of artificial intelligence. Now I take immense pride in introducing Professor Varsha Jain as one of the editors of the book. Professor Varsha is AGK Chair Professor of Marketing and Associate Editor of Four Journals. She has 140 plus publications to her credit and few books such as Consumer Behavior a Digital Native and Purpose Driven Branding. She has been instrumental in shaping learning avenues of various scholars and I would like to invite her first to share his her insights in the book and various contributing authors and their details. Thank you so much, Pat. So I'm really excited uh, to share uh, our book on artificial intelligence in customer services, which we co-edited. And uh, this is the new frontier for the personalized engagement. I will go back and tell you a little background about the book. So this idea was emerged when I was working with uh, Professor Sheth at Emory University in the US three years ago. And uh, that is where we realized that the services industry need a lot of content co-creation because 
uh, it, this is the time where people are actually juggling with AI and how it could be used and uh, optimization of resources can be undertaken. So Professor Shet has sent his apologies. He has a family medical emergency. He's in the hospital. He could not join us. So he has sent this uh, apologies uh, to me. And uh, But he actually ideated the entire uh, framework and the layout of the book, which actually comprises of uh, the opportunities, the evolution, the strategies, the ecosystems that we have, the privacy issues that people are facing, uh, the ethical norms that the people have to follow while using AI uh, at different businesses. And uh, with that, uh, we also have to also understand that uh, we are heading towards personalization. And we are grateful to Macmillan to publish this particular co-edited book. And uh, this book is actually going to help a lot of businesses in uh, understanding the digital space uh, very aptly and effectively because you can optimize the resources very nicely in order to understand how it is heading. Now, why this book? So uh, this is where uh, I go to the context and evolution of this idea where uh, we always discuss through our papers and books that, you know, managing expectations primarily coming from the industry is a way, is a very big challenge for all the managers across the globe. And um, our consumers always want very uh, every service, every product to be delivered quickly. They can't wait. They're very impulsive. So with that, it's very important to understand that these type of expectations cannot be managed only by human, but you need AI to actually assimilate the data points together and make more sense to the consumers and provide them seamless experiences, which the technology can co-create with the human. The whole idea is to provide the premier quality of service, which people are looking for. And this book is primarily written for the industry, uh, researchers, scholars, academicians, because uh, while we were working on the book and while we are working on AI and marketing in different projects and papers as well, while interviewing the CTO, CMOs, and uh, CFOs of different companies across the globe, they are always eager to learn that how this co-creation would happen, how they can effectively use AI into their businesses. So I think it would help uh, all of them, and uh, it would help us to understand what are the primary goals of AI in terms of providing the experiences or maybe engagement, or maybe they are looking for some sort of satisfaction and there could be different ways in which this book can offer uh, the strategies for personalization. Anthropomorphism of AI is something which is uh, very important for the companies to understand. And it could also be very helpful for the people like you all in the uh, research area to understand deep learning, uh, NLP and ML. Now, we had significant contribution uh, from different parts of the world, and I'm really grateful to all of them. We have 21 contributors from different parts of the world. That includes the US, UK, Dubai, Singapore, uh, Germany, Greece, and all of them have significantly contributed to understand the integration of data channel, uh, and opportunities and evolutions with different frameworks, models, and uh, it is very helpful for the industry also to understand how it is spanning out. And, uh, you know, the other good thing about the book is it also talks about the well-being of the customers and the employees, because AI is an enabler. That is something which is there in our mind while we are conceptualizing the whole idea of AI in the customer services. There are a few interesting cases, uh, real-time examples, uh, which also enhances the understanding and the learning. For example, we talk about McDonald's of different chaos, which have been there at different parts of the world like uh, the US as well as in Singapore and other parts as well, where we are talking about the uh, multiple screens which are there. And the whole idea is to empower the consumer because uh, it's all driven by the users. 
Another example is about Netflix. And uh, that is, we all know that in, during COVID, even uh, they were actually working uh, really pretty well. And 19% uh, of growth was there because understanding the AI pattern and uh, the behavioral pattern of the people, uh, they were able to provide the thumbnail, which was very contextualized to the users. Besides that, the interesting example that we have in the book, and again, the credit goes to our contributors, is uh, Lil, which is uh, the virtual influencer. And this influencer, um, it's been portrayed that she lives in the part of the US, which is LA, and she is uh, 19 years old, and she is the brand ambassador of uh, brands like luxury brands, CK, Prada, and uh, Dior, which is very interesting to see that how AI can not only help us to integrate the data, but also create a virtual influencers and connect with the people. Besides that, uh, you know, Harley has also used AI in different fronts, and this is an example in the book again, where it talks about NYC, and during that time, uh, when the AI was used, they were able to cater to 2% of the population, and they were able to sell two to uh, one bike per week, which is amazing uh, growth which they have seen. And the growth rate at which it grew and this entire campaign which was done by Harley in NYC was actually very fruitful because the creative was contextualized basis the user and their understanding about Harley. So uh, with that, they got the growth of 2930%, which is incredible growth. They have never thought that this is going to happen while they are going to use AI. Besides that, uh, we also talk about uh, BMW, where it provides the assistance to the people. And uh, I think Professor Hegre mentioned about that as well. And uh, people are looking for companions, not only as human companions, but as virtual companions as well. And uh, apparently through our other research, we found that, you know, uh, millennials, Generation Y, Z, they are very much comfortable with technology and virtual influencers because there is no judgment. And uh, they can actually use AI and the influencers the way they want. And um, there is another brand, which is Sephora. It uses, uh, again, uh, AI for their virtual uh, agents, for their makeup and beauty care category. And this actually helps a lot of people to understand what would look on, good on them. Besides that, uh, uh, you know, Macy's also uses uh, AI and uh, it helps a lot of people to understand the virtual uh, understanding about the people through behavioral tracking and the way they are looking for. And Macy's is a department store, as we all know, in the U.S. And uh, they come to know that what is good, what is happening, what is trending, and they can usually uh, share with the people. The last and the final example, which I want to give you, is about the social robot. And we all know that social robot. She's named that Sophia. And uh, Sophia is, again, a very interesting uh, robot because uh, she makes, like I was discussing with a few of my colleagues, uh, the world tour. And she came to India as well. She went to Kerala. And uh, now she has the interest in music. And she's exploring those areas as well. And people are keeping track on Sophia then what she is doing next. So these are certain examples which are AI-driven, which is part of our book and uh, they are actually being explained with different concepts and the theories that we have. And uh, with that, that, I will quote few, uh, you know, people, including Professor Shad, uh, what he feels about the book as well. And he mentioned that, you know, in the rapid advances that we see in the AI world, including the chat GPT, it's very important to personalize the experiences that we provide to the customers. And specifically, he said that we have to focus on healthcare and hospitality. Now, with that, we have also the quote from our president, and he has mentioned that AI is to be the part of all the businesses that we do across the globe. And uh, with the real-time understanding about the examples that we have, I think it will span out uh, deeper to make it more personalized services. 
Besides that, we have a few quotes from the con contributors and they are with us and I want to quote them. Uh, first one is Yoshan, thank you so much for sharing your experience about AI. And he mentioned that service uh, revolution is already been seen, standard of living has already been changing primarily in the healthcare and education, which has to be cheaper and better with AI. And with this technology, I think it is going to span out very nicely across the markets. And um, Stephanie, who has uh, contributed the chapter on well-being, she uh, spoke about the human creativity and technology uh, capabilities, which are very important in the AI-driven world. Besides that, we have George, and he's with us. Thank you so much for being with us, George. And he feels that AI has the ability to automate and make impossibles to be possible. And that is where the fraction of the people would relate much better in the AI driven world. And the last part is with our doctoral student, Damini. She says that the privacy is very important parameter for AI, and it has to be dealt very carefully and tactfully because it is connected with the trust. But if it is dealt properly, it will lead to the human uh, centric world. And I wanted to quote all these people because they are all, uh, you know, contributing significantly to the AI driven world and customer services. So thank you so much for all uh, the contributions that we have for the AI world and the customer services. I think this is very important to understand that how it is spanning out and how we are catering to the newer change that we see in the AI world. Because, uh, I always think that we are all social scientists. We always have to feel that, you know, human is at the front end and human intersection is happening with AI, which means that we need to understand the social cultural aspects of the human and its intersection with AI. So I think this is very important in order to understand the AI driven world. And we have to also ensure that the bots that we're using are being used as an enabler and as a tool, which would help us to make our lives better. So thank you so much for being with us again. And I'm looking forward for this exciting journey because this journey has just begun and it's a long way to go in the AI world. Over to you, Path. Uh, thank you, Professor Jain. Uh, now it's time to listen uh, from our keynote speakers. So when we were planning about uh, for the launch of this book, one of the top names which we recalled is uh, none other than Professor uh, Leonard Berry, who has penned down several books and enlightened us about uh, quality of service and the soul of service and the framework for great service and many more. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Berry who is a distinguished professor of marketing at Mays Business School and a senior fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. He's also the past president of uh, American Marketing Association. And he's one of the most uh, cited uh, faculty member at Texas A&M. I think uh, his uh, citations are around 2,35,000 and, and still growing. Uh, he's also a recipient of several awards, including uh, AMA Distinguished Marketing Educator Award, the Shade Gold Medal in Marketing, and and several more. He has also served as a uh, on the as a member uh, as a board on the board of directors of many leading firms as well. So I am elated to have uh, Professor Berry with us, and I would request him to uh, share his keynote address for all of us. Uh, welcome, Professor Berry. Well, thank you. Thank you. And good day, good evening, good morning to all of you. It's my pleasure to be here to uh, honor and celebrate uh, this new book, this new important book. The remarkable development of AI does not diminish the importance of the human dimension in providing service. And that will be my main theme in speaking with you today. The best service organizations today are both high tech and high touch. The best service organizations tomorrow will be both high tech and high touch. The key is to use technology, this marvelous technology that we have, 
in the right way, in a way that actually improves the human condition, in a way that improves the customer experience, both directly, but also improves the customer experience indirectly by enabling human service providers to be more effective. AI can do amazing things. And some of you on this call certainly know more about that than I do, including our next speaker, who's an expert. But even I, as a student of AI, know it can do amazing things. But it can't do everything that matters to customers. It can't do everything. Customers sometimes need high tech and sometimes they need high touch. I've studied services marketing and service quality throughout my entire career. And for the last 20 plus years of my career, I've focused most of my research on healthcare service. And I want to take a few moments and tell you three stories from my work in healthcare. Three of many that I could tell. And you'll see when I tell you these stories where I'm going with them. The first story is about Susan. Susan was my student at Texas A&M University in my seminar, healthcare seminar that I teach, oh, five, six years ago. And today she is in her mid twenties and she's healthy. But when Susan was 14 years old, as she told us in the class, when she was a 14 year old girl, she was diagnosed with brain cancer. And in her one of her papers that she wrote for the course, she told the story about her experience as a frightened 14 year old girl about to undergo surgery for brain cancer. And this is a paragraph that she wrote from her paper. When Ava, my nurse, came by before surgery, she looked at me in the eye and she said, Susan, I'm going to braid your hair back so that we only shave what we need. What Ava did shaped how I viewed myself every time I glanced in the mirror during my recovery. And when I walked into school surrounded by normal girls. Ava probably doesn't remember braiding my hair, but that moment has stuck with me for the last six years. Beautiful story. And it's a story that illustrates the power of human touch. John's story, John is a cancer patient and one of the many cancer patients I've interviewed in my research in oncology. And in the interview, he made this statement. He told me in post-treatment, I was experiencing more fear than with the initial diagnosis of cancer. I had positive outcomes from chemotherapy and surgery, but was really frightened on follow-up visits that something would show up. Lying on the CT table, the computed tomography table, I thought, boy, they sure are taking a lot of pictures. And before one of the follow-up exams, I was especially upset, worried. About 5.30 in the evening before the day of seeing the doctor, the doctor emailed me and said, all of the images look fine. All of the images look fine. And John told me in the interview, it was a huge relief, huge relief. I was gonna see the doctor the next day. I was so worried. I couldn't even eat my dinner. I was so worried, but he took two minutes to email me the night before to tell me everything was okay. And then a third story. And the third story is about a woman I met, and I call her Dancing Kathy. 
Dancing Kathy. Now, Dancing Kathy is a member of an organization that I studied in Michigan last fall. I spent the entire fall semester studying at a main hospital in Michigan, the Henry Ford Health System. And one of their programs is called PACE, P-A-C-E, PACE. It's a U.S. program. And Henry Ford is uh, a sponsor of that program. And the PACE stands for Program for All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And the purpose of PACE is to help elderly, low-income, chronically ill people be able to stay and continue to live in their own homes instead of having to go to a nursing home. So it's really a beautiful concept, a beautiful idea, a beautiful service. And so I studied the PACE uh, facilities in, uh, in Detroit when I was there last fall. And uh, the way PACE works is they uh, they have their own facilities and they transport patients from their own homes. These are often patients who are living alone at home. And they transport them to their own facilities for the day. It's like a daycare facility for elder adults. And then they transport them back home at night. And during the day, the PACE members will in, interact with each other in a lot of different social events and activities. They'll all, there's also medical um, facilities and uh, services at the PACE facilities. So they may see their doctor, see a nurse, get some tests done. Uh, they'll eat two meals, breakfast and, and lunch, and then they are sent home within, to their home from the kitchen with a, a meal for the evening, which they take home. And there's a gym at PACE, uh, the PACE facilities. And so many of, the, many of the patients often work with rehabilitation specialists. So when I met Kathy, it was at the lunchtime at one of the PACE facilities and she was eating at lunch with her friends. And one of the greatest advantages, service advantages of the PACE concept is people who otherwise might be in a very lonely situation go to this facility every day and make a group of friends. And they often sit together at lunch and breakfast with their new friends. And so I, I actually interviewed Dancing Kathy at the lunch table uh, where she introduced me to her friends. And she told me that she had joined PACE one year before. And when she joined PACE, she was in a wheelchair. And her doctors had told her she would be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. But she started to work with a rehab uh, specialist in the gym. And they enabled her to graduate from wheelchair to a walker. And she continued to work with a rehab specialist. And they enabled her to graduate from a walker to a cane. When I met her, she had a cane uh, at the table, the dining room table with her. And she said, now I, I no longer use a wheelchair. I no longer use a walker. I sometimes use a cane. I really don't need it very often, but I like to have it with me. And then she said, and this really surprised me. She said, I can dance. I said, you can dance. You showed up here a year ago in a wheelchair. You can dance. She said, yes, I can do the hustle. And so we arranged for the staff at the PACE facility to turn on the music for the whole cafeteria to hear. And Kathy got up with some of the staff and demonstrated to me and everybody else her ability to dance through the hustle. It was beautiful. And I had, here, I had tears in my eyes when I saw that. So these three stories. I tell you these stories. There's so many more I could tell you. We all have stories like this. But I tell you these stories because in each of these three service experiences, the service clearly exceeded the customer's expectations. 
And what was it that exceeded the customer's expectations? It was the humanness of the service. It was the dignity and civility and caring and kindness of the service that enabled the expectations to be exceeded. Ava, the nurse who braided Susan's hair, the surgeon who took two minutes out of his, his evening to send an email to a patient for tomorrow. And the rehab specialist at the PACE facility who helped Kathy not only learn to walk again, but to learn to dance again. What I've learned in my years studying service quality is that exceeding customer expectations requires pleasant surprise. And the best opportunity for pleasant surprise is when service providers and customers interact. That doesn't mean that AI can't also offer pleasant surprises, it certainly can. And in the future, as the technology advances, it will do even more. But the best opportunity for pleasant surprise is usually the human to human contact. And AI can play a very important supporting role in making that happen. And we'll hear more about that later, I'm sure, from our next speaker. The common characteristics of services that exceed customer expectations, there are six of them, based on the research that I've done with my colleagues. Here are the six. The services are proactive, they're unexpected, they're voluntary, they're meaningful, they're kind, and they're interactive. Again, common characteristics of services that exceed customer expectations. Proactive, unexpected, voluntary, meaningful, kind, and interactive. All six of these characteristics were present in all three of the stories I told you, which is why I wanted to tell, tell you those, those stories. Technology, with all of its great, uh, it's it, its great uh, ability, its 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 great promise, isn't enough. It isn't enough. So let me close with this comment. I teach my students that organization leaders periodically need to ask this big question about their organizations, this big question. If our company were to disappear overnight, would our company be missed? If our company were to disappear overnight, would we be missed? I think it's the most important question managers can ask of their company. And my message to you before I turn it over to our next speaker, Ming Hui, my next, my closing idea is that companies that are truly excellent in both tech and touch are best positioned for the future and more likely to be missed. The book that we celebrate today, Artificial Intelligence and Customer Service, is an important contribution to the service field. It will help guide managers to use AI in the most important and effective ways. It will stimulate more academic research, which we need. So I congratulate all of the authors, all of the contributors. I think I saw my friend Johan Wirtz uh, on the call today, very good friend of mine for many years. He is a contributor of one of the chapters and everything he writes is excellent. So I congratulate you on the book and the launching of the book. I'm so happy to be part of this. 
I also want to mention we're celebrating uh, artificial intelligence and customer service today, as we should. This is its launch day. But I also want to mention, if it's okay, that there's another very important book that's been published. And it's been published by our next speaker and by Roland Rust, her co-author. The Feeling Economy, How Artificial Intelligence is Creating the Era of Empathy. And I see these two books together as a two compendiums together is providing the guidance that we need at this time. This is such a crucial time for AI with so much hype, so much interest, so much investment, so much going on to have two important books available at the same time. That's what we need. So I thank you all. Uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of our program today and for the discussion that we'll have. Thank you so much, Professor Barry, for sharing your wonderful insights and also quoting high tech and high touch organizations as a need and services should extend and exceed customer expectations So, Now we turn on lights to our next speaker, Professor Meng. She is a distinguished professor at National Taiwan University and a distinguished research fellow, fellow at the Center for Excellence in Research at University of Maryland, an international research fellow at the University of Oxford Center for Corporate Reputation. Professor Ming currently serves as an editor-in-chief of Journal of Service Research and as a chair of Informed Service Section and Asia representative of the Board of AME. He previously served as a vice president of the Association for Information Systems and was recently named a fellow of the European Marketing Academy. Professor Ming has an extensive publication record in academic journals, such as Journal of Service Research, Journal of Marketing, Marketing Science, JAMS, GEMS, and Journal of Consumer Psychology, and managerial publications such as the California Management Review, Harvard Business Review, and MIT Solon Management Review. Her most recent book has remarked by Professor Berry is incredible, The Feeling of Economy, How Artificial Intelligence is Creating the Era of Empathy, and we should read it further along the side. With no further delay, I would request Professor Ming to share her insights on AI in service for personalized engagement. Over to you, Professor Ming. Thank you for, for the introduction. I feel touched every time. Every time when I listen to uh, to Len's talk, I always feel so touched because he is such a high touch person, and he emphasized he he really lay out so nicely that high touch is so important for customer service. Now I want you to switch to the other side, high tech, because we want both. Customer service need both, so we can never emphasize we can never de-emphasize the importance of high touch customer service. But I want to bring it to your attention about how we can leverage the feeling capability of AI to help us, to help us to, to, to take care of customers. And uh, so I would like to share my slides. Yeah. Uh, it's not. Does it show? Can you see it? Yes. But yes. it's not on um, full screen, right? No, not full screen. Yeah. Okay. At least it can be same my same my full screen. So what I want to talk about is the high tech aspect of customer service. How can we use AI to serve customers? And then you can see that I have feeling AI here, feeling AI here because I always believe in my in my uh, series of papers we believe that AI have multiple intelligences because AI is designed to mimic human intelligence. And you can ask yourself, are you? Are you better in feeling intelligence or are you better in thinking intelligence? Most scholars are trying to have thinking intelligence. 
but by nature, by nature, we we all all need human touch. So we all have the feeling needs, but sometimes we may not have feeling intelligence. Feeling intelligence means that you have the capability to understand your own emotion, to understand your customer's emotion, other people's emotion, and to manage the emotion. So based on the multiple AI intelligence field, uh, I consider that feeling AI, AI, different kind of AI intelligence can serve different customers' need. For mechanical AI, that is designed for routine test automation. It can serve customers who want efficiency. For thinking AI, that is designed for analytical decision. It can serve customers who want precision. And for feeding AI, that's what I'm talking about today. That is for it is it's designed for human interaction. And then that can serve customers who want empathy and understanding. And this is the part that is rapid uh, advancing but it's also the part that we are, we really need it in customer service, but it's also the part that we don't know very well about how can we leverage the feeding capability of AI to serve customers. And so if I define, if I define feeding AI uh, in greater detail, it also can reflect the multiple AI intelligence perspective. Feeding AI, in my definition, is AI for human communications and interactions. So it's not about AI to AI communication. It's AI that can be used, play a role for human communications and interactions. So it can be, it can be mechanical. It, it can be somewhat mechanical because, for example, when you want to use AI to capture emotion data, you have biosensor, you have facial capturing, uh, detection, and the recognition. Those tasks are, those feeding tests are quite mechanical, but you still can focus on the emotion part. When you need to capture a customer's emotion, that is very important for customer service because you want to know what they feel. You want to recognize what they feel. Then you can use mechanical feeding AI to capture emotion data. Then you also can use a thinking feeding AI to analyze customer emotion. We use this quite often already. This, this part is quite mature. We can have emotion analytics. We can have sentiment analysis. We all routinely use thinking feeling AI to, to help us understand customer's emotion. And this is also very important in customer service because this technology, thinking feeling technology really help human customer service personnel to agent to understand what, what kind of emotions that customers are experiencing so that the human agents can do a better job. And uh, at, the, at the highest level, we have the true feeling AI, that is feeling feeling AI that can be used to understand human emotions. And then that's what we have now, we begin to see all these, uh, the conversational AI, empathetic AI, uh, especially for example, ChatGPT is designed to be a conversational by definition, by design. And then that really can help human interactions and communication. So based on that, I also want to illustrate another one that is feeding AI also can be used in strategic marketing, not just a service. Uh, so for example, you can use feeding AI to, for customer understanding in, in marketing research. Then you, in marketing strategy, you also can use feeding AI to help developing positioning slogan. And so that you really can touch customer's heart. Feeding AI actually is doing very, a very good job these days for this. And then you also can use feeding AI to, uh, to establish relationships with customers uh, in addition to precisation. And so you can see that based on all these uh, previous words, uh, we work on or different multiple AI intelligences and we also have different subtypes of feeding AIs. And then we begin to think, uh, begin to think that what would be the journey? What would be the journey to move customers, move customers from Initially, you want to capture their emotional data so that you can understand what kind of emotions they are experiencing. And then you want to show your, your, your empathy. And then you want to solve their problems, help them manage their emotions, and eventually establish an emotional connection. Uh, how, can we, how can we do this? How can we move customers from stage one to the eventually establish emotional connection. So we call this a customer care journey. Customer care journey uh, is more like a, a practitioner's term. Practitioner term like to, call, like to use the term customer care because they think it's more proactive and is really take the initiative to care about customers. And then also, you can see, it also focuses on establishing, it also 
focus on improve customers' emotional well-being. It's not just solving customers' problems, but it's so important in in customer service because we all know that customer service very often is emotionally highly emotionally charged. Like customers, for example, from uh, if you if if they are not happy with your service as a so the service failure, then when they contact when they contact the company. If, very often it's so emotionally charged that, that some customers cannot express their emotion accurately or clearly. And some customers really need your understanding, need your shoulder to listen, need your ears to listen to while they want to complain. And so all these are not just uh, AI need to solve, AI need to, or customer service agent needs to solve customers' problem. You need to understand the emotional part because customer service very often is really emotional charge. And so in this in this customer care journey for emotion recognition, so AI need to identify the customer's emotion accurately to initiate the customer care. Accurately, I want to emphasize that is the uh, perform uh, performance metrics because if you cannot recognize customer emotion accurately, then you cannot move to the next stage. That is very important. And for emotional understanding, feeling AI need to express empathetic understanding of the customer's emotion. And then your first response probably would think, oh, AI cannot be empathetic. Actually, this is one, the one strength of the modern AI because it interacts with you directly. So the AI, so AI learn from the customer's perspective. It's very easy for for feeling AI to 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 take customers' perspective and to to express emp empathetic understanding, it does not really have to be the the emotional understanding in the human way that involves biological reactions, but they do can they can they can be very empathetic in in their expression because it learns from your input directly. For example, when you interact with ChatGPT, ChatGPT you learn from your input, so. It, I always call ChatGPT is a human pleaser because it learn from your input and it, 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 it do whatever, it do whatever you like because the default design is, is it is a helpful, helpful assistant. That's the default role it plays. So like this is actually is a strength, it's the strength of uh, modern feeding AI. And for emotional management, you need to win the customer service by providing helpful recommendation. It, the recommendation need to be helpful. So you can say this is more like the thinking, thinking, feeling AS job that come up with the, uh, the recommendation that can help customers uh, solve the problem, cause solve the uh, problems and the manage the emotion. And you also probably can see that uh, very, very often, it depends on whether customers, a lot of customers, as long as you really can be empathetic about their situation, the problem, the, the 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 problem, the service problem gone away, and a lot of situations there are problems that really need to be solved. So this is a more thinking part of the of the customer journey to provide helpful recommendation, and eventually you can establish emotional connection with customers, and from which you can improve customer emotional well being. I think in one of the chapters you talk about employee uh, service employees well being. You can see that because it's interaction, it can be a win win. It can be when the customer's emotional well-being is improved, and as well as the employee's emotional uh, well-being improved too. And from that, you can deepen customer relationship and have long-term uh, profitability win, a long-term profitability to the customers. So I want to show this good AI example, uh, feeling AI for the customer care journey. And I will show you a bad AI example too. So for emotion recognition, so you can see that Kathy, Kathy is the is ABC Airlines customer care bot, and so he called. As she called, she called Mark the customers uh, who has an upcoming treat uh, to Indiana, and uh, so from the way from the way that uh, Mark, uh, Mark is talking, and also from what Mark is is looked, and uh, Kathy says that. Um, Mark is feeling sad. So that's the emotion recognition part. The, the emotional signal may not be consistent. Very often, customers want to, some customers want to uh, exaggerate their emotions. Some customers don't want to reveal their emotions. And so in that case, you really need to take all the signals. So Mark sounds calm, but looks sad. And Kathy need to be able to recognize 
the emotion, marks emotion accurately. And then for the second stage, after you recognize emotion accurately, you can move on to a second stage, understand the emotion. So Kathy said, I'm, I'm truly sorry for your loss. I understand you are going through a difficult time. So empathetic understanding uh, about Mark's situation. And the third stage, emotion management. So Kathy said, we want to make your travel experience as comforting as possible. Any specific request to help you? This is very important. I define this as question asking, question asking initiative. Any AI at the, for the chatbot, they need to be able to ask questions, not just to respond, not just to answer questions. And the, the current uh, AI design, chatbot design, have relatively weak capability to ask questions. They are so good at answering questions. So for emotion management, it's better that chatbot can ask questions so that it can understand what the customers want directly. So Marcel acquired Windows 6 and the cafe tried to beat uh, the data request and with additional package. And uh, eventually emotional connection. So you can see after cafe has done all this and Mark really appreciate the understanding and the help. And uh, so at this at this end, you can see the emotional emotional connection has been established between the chatbot and the chatbot Mark, the customers. This is a good example. That's what we want to achieve. But we know very often that nowadays, very often the chatbot is not so mature, especially if you use a bad chatbot. And so for emotion recognition, you can see that Kathy again a call and uh, want to know whether uh, whether anything she could do for Mark. And Mark say, I'm going to Indiana for my mother's funeral. I'm feeling down and overwhelmed. So in, in this scenario, you can see that Mark actually reveal his true emotion. But even if Mark reveals his true emotion, uh, Kathy say, okay, have a nice trip. Let us know how you, what, if you need any help. And so you can see that Mark will be very annoyed. Even at the beginning, Mark just feel sad. And uh, if if Mark feel that Kathy can understand his emotion, he feel annoyed, he begin to feel angry. And for emotion management, uh, Kathy did not ask question. That's what I want to show in the previous slide. Question asking is very important because from question asking, you can explore what customers really need. So uh, even say you should check out some local attractions in Indiana and Mark get very angry at this time already. It's not a vacation, I'm grieving my mother's death. And uh, so at the, at the end, uh, there's an emotional disconnection uh, between your company, the job by your company and the customers. So you can see the good example, good AI example and bad AI example. And then I show how you should use feeding AI uh, for the customer care to move customers along the customer care journey. And of course, uh, I'm talking about in the, in the previous slides, I'm talking about the high high tech aspect about how we can use AI and how should we use AI correctly so that we can leverage AI's uh, advantage, relative advantage uh, to 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 agile this human intelligence. And in another article, uh, published in Journal of Retailing, a framework for collaborative R AI in, in marketing, we emphasize we we pointed out. Uh, how HI and AI can collaborate. I think that is really very important if we want to have a high touch and high tech balance in customer service. And that mainly is really to look at, if you look at the red part, for the red part, you can see that. For the feeding job, for the feeding job, mechanical feeding AI really can handle uh, all, the, all these tasks or interactions that does not even, it's, it's not contextual. It's not contextual, so that is okay for AI to handle. And or they can do the thinking, analytical thinking. That would be the, the sentiment analysis, emotion analysis that feeling AI can do. Or it can feeling analytical, so analyze customer emotion. And then they can provide these analysis to help the right hand side, help the human agents, agents to manage, to interact the front line with, customer, with customers. And which part? Which, which role the AI should play and which role the HI should play, it really depends on which one has relative advantage. So you can see on the right-hand side, this figure will show that for mechanical AI, mechanical AI, actually AI, for mechanical tasks, AI can do much better. For thinking AI, 
AI can augment humans uh, in, in many, many aspects. And uh, in, even for many tasks, in customer service tasks, it can do better than humans. So human can really focus on doing the feeding part. That's what the feeding economy book is, is talking about. Because thinking AI is so good, that can help. They can augment human feelings. And so you can see, as soon as uh, AI can do a better job, then AI will take care of the task, a customer service task. If humans can do a better job, then humans will do the, uh, will take care of that. And then which one should do the job? You can see it really depends on which, what kind of customers we're talking about. Typically the Z generation, they, they, they like all kinds of AI. Uh, or different kind of AI, even if feeding AI uh, is not very, even if some feeding AI is not very mature, they don't, they don't, they don't mind. And uh, you can also consider service contests, like Link uh, mentioned uh, in, in healthcare contests. In healthcare contests, the emotion is so relevant, is so strong. Very often, high touch customer service is more important than high tech customer service. So in conclusion, for this book, congratulations, congratulations on this book. I cannot believe more that artificial intelligence really can play a significant role in customer service. So I'm, so I'm very happy to see this book. And uh, so using AI to solve customer problems and enhance customer well-being is a pinnacle of customer service excellence. This is what I believe. And uh, this book explores AI in customer service engagement, experience, and well-being, all these are emotional, emotional concepts. And so that really, really is at the frontiers, uh, telling, giving us insights about how can we use AI for these purposes. Mostly to help, to augment, to collaborate together with human customer service, but it can help in a lot of situations that we can together, AI and HR together, to uh, deliver excellent customer service. So thank you. That's what I would like to talk today. Thank you so much, Professor Ming, for sharing your such a great insights. And it was so nice to hear from you on leveraging the feeling capability of artificial intelligence and the customer care journey. Now it is my delight to invite Professor Varsha Jain to please summarize the session from the keynote speaker and also address the question and answer session for the day. Uh, thank you, Bart. Uh, thank you, Lan, and thank you, Ming. I think uh, it was a wonderful combination of the insights which you have actually shared with us, which was about the human touch, which uh, then I think with the stories were very emotional, but they were also helping us to understand the importance of touch in the customer services and how it has worked so well. So thank you so much for sharing that. And Ming, thank you so much for sharing uh, your models and frameworks uh, where uh, AI can actually leverage and the tech part of it. We are really, uh, grateful for your work with, and the contributions with both of you have been doing in the customer services area and constantly developing uh, the discipline as a whole. So thank you so much. It was really wonderful to hear out your insights and to learn more about AI. As I said at the beginning, and I've been telling that AI is a journey and we co-create knowledge and we learn from each other. So thank you so much for sharing those insights. Uh, I have a few questions and uh, it is talking about the first one, I think, uh, Len, if it would be nice if you would address that uh, how the human and technology can actually work together and manage the expectations of the consumers and their perceptions and satisfaction. So you've been working very extensively into those areas of customer services, how you see uh, the involvement of technology happening there? Yes, I, I see um, the value of technology um, as situational. Uh, sometimes all we need is technology because what the customer needs is a highly reliable, convenient, uh, service experience, service solution. 
and and basically what the customer needs is good technology um, because in the world of technology in which we live today uh, <clears throat> convenience is is king what used to be fast is now slow and uh, so technology in general artificial intent intelligence in particular has a very important role to play in improving improving service but everything is situational and and I really appreciated uh, Ming Huang's uh, Hui's, uh, stories and and the one about the airline uh, with Kathy and and the customer the who was flying um, because of a family you know a, a family situation um, and was highly the customer is highly emotional. That's where uh, technology gets tricky, and you have to be really careful to provide the right kind of service to fit the situation. Um, yeah, so let me uh, let me stop there and 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 see if if uh, Ming Hui has anything to add to that. Sure. Ming Hui would you like to add anything. I think we uh, deliberately choose that example to show that you can see is a mark has a sadness feeling. And sadness feeling is sometimes, sometimes it's a feeling that you prefer to be alone and you prefer not to interact uh, with, uh, other, with other people. So that would be a situation that a feeling AI can do something, do something to really uh, talk to the customers, uh, talk to customers that will, customers will, will have lower level resistance. So I, I, I cannot agree more that as Len said, feeling is very subjective. And we have all different kinds of feeling, different kinds of emotions, different kinds of emotional intensities. So in that situation, AI can help in a lot of situations. We need to understand the nature of the emotion so that we can use feeling AI in the right way. Customer doesn't want to talk about sadness. Actually, feeling AI can do it. When customers don't want to talk to other people too, when you feel sad, but when customers feel angry, if we feel angry, then they want to talk. When they want to talk, yes, yeah, so that's good. You can understand uh, what's the issue and how you can resolve it. But then the new issue will be your customer service agent often hurt because the angry customers, a lot of CEO and the CCOs really, uh, express that uh, angry customers, they feel very difficult to handle, handle angry customers. So that will be also a situation that feeling AI can help as a buffer in that situation that they can deal with the angry customers, try to calm the angry customer down uh, so that uh, Customer service agent doesn't have to be in the front line to 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 run the risk of their own emotional well-being. So there are a lot of situations you need you can use feeding AI to keep, to to take care of customers, but it really requires a lot of design, service design uh, considerations. Sure. I completely agree with both of you. Yeah, that has to be managed very tactfully while uh, you are handling the expectations of the consumers, which are always changing uh, and pretty contextual and situational in nature. So with that, I think uh, they quite a bit on the feeling aspect, Ming, uh, which is about the feeling AI and how that feeling of AI can actually culminate into the trust part that you deliver in customer service. So if you can elaborate a little more uh, on to say that how the feeling AI can develop the trust and take that forward in managing the services effectively. No. Uh, I think I think the trust I, I would like to refer to refer to our our framework that a trust will not be built up uh, 
immediately. It will be the same. Human to human trust is built over time and built over interactions. So I will consider that for our customer care journey, if you can move customers step by step, instead of jump into any, okay, I want to have an emotional connection with you. I want to help you to manage your emotion. If you just jump in into those stages, then customers won't trust you. So you will need to go in step by step uh, along the journey so you can establish trust. And also trust probably won't be able to, to establish. Another issue I would like to mention, of course, the privacy issue you mentioned. Yeah, for, for using fitting AI to take care of customers around the risk of infringing into customers' privacy because you will use AI, feeding AI to capture customers' emotion data. And then you use thinking, feeding AI to analyze customers' emotion. And so in that situation, then customers may not want to, and may not want to reveal their emotion. They don't want to be taken care of in this way. So that is really a, really a, a, a big issue that we need to be careful about. And uh, there are many ways to there are many ways to manage that. Uh, first, you need to understand uh, your customers' uh, uh, sensitivity, emotional sensitivity, and also the privacy sensitivity. And uh, you also need to know your customers prone to trust uh, AI or trust humans. Yes, yeah, sure, there are a customer heterogeneity here. So there, yeah, it's really a big issue that when we use AI to take care of customers, uh, we need to really pay special attention to this possibility. Sure, and to extend that for the uh, one follow-up question was that how does that affect the relationship or management with the help of feeling AI? Uh, could do you elaborate that how customer services can manage the relationship with the customers? Uh, it really depends on who you use you use feeding AI in the front end or the back end. That is, if you use it in the back end, it usually help uh, mm -hmm. human customer service agent uh, to understand to recognize customer emotion. A lot of a lot of customer service agent doesn't have that talent. Mm. Tend to to recognize customers' emotion, and uh, some customer uh, service agent doesn't have the skill to be empathetic about customers' emotion. Mm. So it really can work together with human service agent. It means not everyone need to have those feeling capability. Is not really so trainable, and if we recognize this is the situation, then feeling AI really can help. It, it make a customer service in one way, a feeling AI can do more and the feeling uh, and the humans can do less. Or it can also widen the possibility to more humans to work together with feeding AI so that they can do the job well. When AI can support them, okay, if for one customer service agent, he is not very empathetic by, by nature, then feeding AI uh, as a human pleaser really can help can provide information uh, to the human service agent, to the service agent to help him understand the customers. And also very often nowadays, it will provide right on the monitor of the customer service agent. Okay, now the customer is frustrated. Uh, you need to phrase your response this way. It can be displayed in real time, just on the, on the customer service agent uh, monitor. In this way, it helps. They help customer service agent to respond in a very empathetic way. And so it's more like uh, feeling AI can be in the back end and at the mm -hmm. front end. It depends on what customers like. Also depends on how, to what degree a human agent can do and also to what degree uh, the feeling AI is, a, is mature to do the job. So all three participants, all three parties we can consider really to, to, to achieve a, a best balance and to use the a feeding air for uh, uh, serving customers. Sure, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights. I think this was very helpful. And you addressed three questions that were connected to the same area. So thank you for that. Uh, Len, there's a question about the circle scale and how that scale could actually now can be extended or maybe the research can be done around it 
uh, related to privacy and ethics and in the AR driven world, how we would see that coming out. No. Uh, Varsha, before I answer, uh, address that question, uh, let me add uh, some more context to the discussion sure. we just had, which, you know, I think really goes to the part of the issues we're discussing today, and that is the uh, the appropriate roles mm -hmm. or the most effective roles for uh, AI and human service to uh, to team up mm -hmm. and provide a better combined service than could be provided with one or the other alone. And 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 what I wanted to share. In, in that is that there's a really a, a quite an interesting uh, development that I'm following closely in the United States in healthcare today and in other parts of the world too, but it's, um, it's developing quite rapidly in the United States and it's called Hospital at Home, mm. where uh, certain patients are receiving hospital care but in their home instead of in the hospital, because hospital care in the hospital is very expensive care. And we have many hospitals that are overburdened today that don't have enough room uh, for all of their patients. And so this is a, uh, this is developing uh, throughout the United States with some of our, our major hospital systems where they're taking patients at normally would stay in the hospital for particular illness, let's say for 10 days. But after three days, they're discharging them from the hospital and they're moving them to their home to continue to receive hospital level care. Mm -hmm. Reason I wanted to bring up that particular example is because what we have learned very clearly in the evolution of hospital at home in America is we have learned that when you move a patient to their home, it's very important to start with human-based service, mm. where the providers are coming into the home, building a relationship, getting familiar with the home, uh, building a relationship, not only with the patient, but with the family. And that's the hospital home team that may be very different from the, the clinicians who took care of the patient when the patient was actually in the hospital physically. And so it's very, very important to start with the human connection and build that relationship and build that trust. And then what the, what the evidence is showing is once you've built that relationship, you've, you've built that trust and the patient, the family members have a phone number to call uh, to particularly people they've already met and gotten to know on the medical team then you can gravitate more to telehealth and other remote types of care uh, as the hospital home um, experience uh, continues. And so I think that's relevant to the discussion that, that, that we had is, is um, when trust is the issue, when, uh, when your customer is anxious, when your customer needs reassurance and authenticity to start with to start with the human and in in order to build that trust to build that relationship to build that customer's confidence that confidence that that human will be there when the human is needed then you pave the way more effectively for these high emotion types of services pave the way more effectively for remote types of services for technology. So I just wanted to make, make that, that particular uh, a point. In terms of, uh, in, in terms of SurfQual, uh, I, I think that, uh, that AI can, can help us refine the, the instrument, because that's what SurfQual is, it's, a, it's an instrument by better understanding the, uh, the customer that we want to learn more about through, uh, through uh, this, this particular uh, uh, vehicle that we call SurfQual or other 
related types of, of, of survey instruments. So I, I see uh, benefit, uh, not a downside for that. Again, like everything else, uh, think of AI as an enabler. Uh, Marsha, I think that was your phrase earlier today. Think of AI as an enabler. If we think of AI that way in general, I think we're going to be better off. So. Sure. Thank you so much. I think this was very helpful for all the researchers and scholars because they've been using the SOLCOM for all their services, marketing, research. And thank you for reiterating that AI is more as an enabler. With that note, only we ideated this book. So thank you for reiterating. Uh, one last question that I have is about how the cell service and AI can actually provide competitive advantages to the businesses. So, Thank you. you want to go first, May? So how I can how I can provide competitive? And can you repeat the question? Yeah. So uh, the question is that how self service and AI can integrate together to provide competitive advantages to the businesses. So AI and the human service agent team up together. Yes. Yeah, I think. I think I, I talk a lot about that uh, in my previous responses. So really, basically, basically, I was thinking it depends on it depends on whether AI can do better or a human can do better. It depends on a customer's preference, uh, whether the customers like technology or high like high tech or like high touch, and it also depends on what is the task that you are, you are dealing with? What kind of emotions or what kind of problems you need to solve in, in customer stories? All three factors need to be considered in order, like, in order to us, for us to, uh, a service provider to decide the best, uh, the best AI HI team to deliver a customer service. Sure. Len, could you elaborate with an example? Because you work with so many companies, I think. Would be helpful. Yes, I can. I, I think that's an excellent question. What what our experience has been with self service technologies through the years is that in general service recovery has been less effective when customers use self service and there's a failure than when customers use a human service delivered. Um, solution and there's a failure mm -hmm. because the latter when when the human uh, provider is involved from the beginning there's someone for the customer to go to and say this didn't work can you help me but when you're at an atm machine and you you deposit money in it eats your money and does give you credit um uh, or uh you're uh, using any other kind of, of, of self-service uh, and you're you're alone on an island when there's a failure. There's no one to call. You mm -hmm. go on the website and, and there's not even a phone number on many web com company websites, which by the way, I think is a huge service failure. You know, companies need to want their customers to be able to get a hold of them when customers want to get a hold of them. That's just... That, that's uh, service quality ABC. And, and and yet even today, you go on many websites of companies and, and, and there's no phone number because they don't want you to call. They don't want the trouble. They don't want to have to pay the labor to answer those calls. So where AI comes in and self-service is because traditionally recovery has been so poor with self-service technologies where the customer's left on an island with no one to turn to. There's a service failure, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. That's where I think AI can play a great role. Number one, to, to, um, to minimize the service failures in the first place with self-service technology. And number two, to pop up to recover when there is a mm -hmm. service failure. Mm -hmm. 
Right. I agree with you completely. This was excellent uh, points that you've shared with us. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Len and Ming, for all the insights that you shared for the questions. Thank you, everybody in the audience for sharing the questions. I have integrated quite a bit uh, to make the questions a little simpler. But if you have more questions, you can write to us and we'll be happy to share our experiences and help you to understand the AI world with the ongoing journey of AI. Uh, because I think there's so much going on. It's every day we are learning about the AI. With that, I would like to now invite my co-editor of the book, Hanupama, to provide the closing remark and the thank you note for everybody. Uh, over to you, Hanupama. Uh, thank you, Professor Jain and uh, all the speakers. So today evening, uh, we understood the importance of high tech and high touch and, uh, and the potential of AI uh, to redefine what firms can do for customers. So as we draw the curtains on this memorable event, I would like to uh, propose my word of thanks on behalf of Maika and the team of co-editors. I would like to thank our speakers of the day, uh, Professor Berry and Professor Huang for your insights. And, and we are uh, definitely uh, lucky to, to hear and learn from you on this important day. Uh, I would also uh, extend my thanks to uh, Dr. Hegde, uh, the Dean of Maika, for her presence, support, and, and encouraging words today. And uh, a sincere gratitude uh, to the esteemed audience. Uh, you were uh, very interactive. Uh, I can see a lot of discussions over the chat box and the very interesting questions. So this definitely added uh, immense value to this event. And finally, and importantly, uh, I express my gratitude to our incredible uh, contributors across the globe. Uh, there have been some very immense and impactful thoughts which you can uh, read in the book. So thank you again and uh, happy reading and uh, wishing you a happy rest of the day, evening, afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Anupama. And uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being with us in this AI journey. Thank you, Yoshin. Thank you, all the contributors. Thank you, my co-editors. Thank you, my distinguished speakers, uh, for being with us. Uh, I know it's very uh, difficult to make time out for every event, but still you all are here in different parts of the world and making it really an incredible journey of AI. All my colleagues, my students, researchers, scholars across the globe, all eager to learn more about AI and co-create the knowledge. So thank you everybody for being with us and the journey continues. I would see a lot of work coming out for the AI world because we all need to constantly work, understand, and also remember as Len has clearly mentioned the human touch part of it not getting away from it and also coming back to Ming and saying that how AI can constantly evolve to solve the problem of customer services. So with that thought, thank you so much and thank you once again for being with us. Thank you, everybody.